G'day and welcome to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Today we are talking sell high. These players are playing out of their minds right now. You need to trade them now to get the most valuable possible. Let's go! Jordan, open! Chicago with the lead! Bryant, to Not a game, not a game. We talking about practice. LeBron James with no record for human life. Here he basketball! G'day and welcome again to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Casey, and you can find me on Twitter at Ball Boys NBA and on Instagram at Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball. Today, talking sell highs, um, our last podcast, our last video, we were talking the buy low candidates. So if you haven't already, make sure you go and check that one out uh, as well. We had seven players that we're going to go through, including a pretty controversial one at the end there as well. So Make sure you check that one out, guys. Give it a big old thumbs up. And uh, again, make sure you guys are subscribed. We're going to be doing lots of fantasy content during the season. So hit subscribe, grab the notification bell, flick it. Make sure you're getting uh, notifications. So uh, when these videos do drop, um, that you are getting uh, straight onto it so you can get that information real quick so you can beat your other teammates to the waiver wire, beat your teammates to the information so you can be one step ahead and one step closer to winning your fantasy basketball uh, league. So make sure, again, subscribe, notification bell on, and uh, follow me on Twitter. So let's get stuck into it. Uh, I'm going to go through some sell high, guys. There's some really obvious ones at the top there, so I try to st- stay away from some of them. I-, I do touch on some of the really obvious ones as well. But just like we did with the buy low, guys, I'm trying to also give you guys a bit of a target of the kind of player that I would be hoping to get with some of these players um, and why I think these guys are sell highs outside of their rankings. Because like we said in the buy low can, uh, show, rankings right now are, are next to useless. The rankings are all over the shop. Blocks, steals, field goal percentage, free throw percentage, turnovers, they're all low variance, uh, sorry, high variance, low volume um, categories and statistics that sw- uh, swing uh, value wildly early on in the season. So there's really lots and lots of wacky things, but things will always settle down and um, you know smooth over as the season goes along. So the rankings will bring up, but I don't want to get too stuck onto the rankings and just have a look at really what the player is doing and uh, what they are doing compared to what we expected them to do. So let's start here with a big, big name, a player that I'm sure everyone loves to, if you have him on your roster, you're loving it right now. Ja Morant. Um, this is probably two years in a row that I've had Ja Morant as a sell high at the start of the season. And, and, and look, for good reason. It, his name value is worth a lot in fantasy basketball leagues. Now, this is predominantly for category leagues in a points league. I don't know if you should be selling high on Ja Morant at this point because he is legitimately a first-round player in points leagues. But... In category leagues, he is currently the ninth ranked player so far this season through four games. He's averaging 35 points. Wow. He's averaging three threes. Wow. 4.3 rebounds, seven assists, a steal, 0.8 blocks, shooting 54.8% from the field. Wow. And 86% from the free throw line. Also, wow. Um, so those things there that we were wowing. <laughs> I don't think that they're going to continue at those kind of volume. Now, the reason I think that you can execute a sell high on Ja Morant, and uh, maybe you don't want to if you're the person who drafted him because he was going very high in drafts, um, but hear me out. Ja Morant is not going to be scoring 35 points per game. Pretty obvious, not many players do. He might be someone who scores 28, 29, maybe even 30 points per game. That's excellent. He's also not going to be scoring three threes per game. Last year, he averaged 1.5. So he's not going to double his threes in one season when the previous two seasons, he's been 1.5, 1.2. He might be getting better at shooting threes, so he might be getting closer to two threes per game. That is 100% possible. The assists are fine. He's, he's going to continue to do that, so that's cool. Um, a steal per game, yep, I can believe that. 0.8 blocks, 
not outrageously, um, you know, if you said he was going to average 0.8 blocks, I wouldn't necessarily laugh in your face. I don't. I think it might tick down closer to half a block per game, but sure, that's fine. And then the last one, 50... Uh, 5% from the field goal percentage or 54.8% field goal. That is definitely going to come down. Now, he is a good field goal percentage guy for a point guard. Don't get me wrong. But he is not a mid-50s in field goal percentage. He is a low 50s, high 40s guy. So, And then the last thing, which is probably maybe the biggest um, thing that's going to change, is his free throw percentage. Now, he, again could improve and he could be an 80 or a 79% guy but to him for him to go from 76% to 86% a whole 10 percentage points increase and on the volume that he takes them it's a huge huge difference um, now if you are someone who is in a punt free throw percentage build, I guess you don't really care. It doesn't really matter to you because it's probably not going to be good enough to change your free throw percentage around or maybe it is and you just sort of accept that and um, and move on. But in terms of the way people view him as a ranking point of view, teams that are not punting free throw percentage, maybe you can execute and extract good value on that and say that, hey, look, he's improving. He's young. He's going to be an MVP candidate this season. His free throw percentage is always going to get better. Um, I don't think that all of those things stick. Maybe one or two of them stick, but not all four of them. So the points, the threes, the field goal percentage, and the free throw percentage. At least two of those things are going to drop, and they're going to jump fairly significantly. So if I am able to get a first-round player or a top 15 guy, one of those kind of players that we sort of thought at the start of the season where there was a pretty consensus top 13, top 14, in my opinion, um, you could I would 100% do that. So... If you can get someone like a Trey Young, I would 100% do it. If you can get someone like a Tyrese Halliburton, I would do it. If you can get someone like a... uh Again, LaMelo Ball is injured at the moment, so that's a bit of a shit one. Um, James, uh, Jason Tatum's playing really well. James Harden's playing really well. So you might not be able to get those guys... Um, you know, maybe it is someone like a Devin Booker. I'd probably do that as well. I'd rather Devin Booker on my team in most scenarios. Uh, if you could get someone like uh, Kyrie Irving, now you might not really want to deal with Kyrie Irving, but personally for myself, it's especially depending on the build that I was in, I might prefer to have Kyrie Irving on my team. So those kind of players, I would be happy to trade John Morant for um, very comfortably. And uh, I think that because of his excitement level, his name recognition, you can get some really, really good returns for a player like Ja Morant. So for me, those are the guys that I think that you should be targeting. I'm sure I've left someone out. So uh, if you have any suggestions or players that you think you might be wanting to trade or sell high on Ja Morant, drop them down in the comments and I'll see if I can get to as many as I can. But I think right now he is a good sell high because I think you can get a very, very handsome return for Ja Morant. The next guy here, Freddie Van Vliet. Now, Fred Van Vliet is a player that I've always really liked. He's he's often underrated in fantasies, but right now, again, if you look at the rankings, he's the seventh-ranked guy through five games. He's playing an absurd 39 minutes per game. He's only averaging 16 points, 15.8, but it's the nearly three threes, four rebounds, eight assists, 2.8 steals, um, shooting 95 or 94.4% from the line, only turning it over 1.2 times per game. Um, those steals, as good of a good, as good of a defensive stat guy as he is, 2.8 steals is absurd. He is not going to do that. That will basically uh, come down to 1.8 at the most. So you're going to lose an entire steal per game off his value. And, um, you know, shooting 42.1% from the field, that actually is probably high for Fred Van Vliet. Um, he's a guy that typically is the worst contributor to field goal percentages, um, in, especially when you take into account his volume. So I think that that definitely has uh, potential to come down. So those are probably the two biggest things um, that will affect his value. The rest of it is actually probably pretty sustainable. Maybe he turns the ball over a little bit more. Um, but as soon as those deals come down to 1.8 instead of 2.8, you're going to see him drop back 20 spots. So again, if I'm able to get a top 15 um, player for Fred Van Vliet, I'm definitely looking to do so. So if I can get Tyrese Halliburton for Fred Van Vliet, I'm doing it every day of the week. If I can get a Kyrie Irving, again, I'm doing it. If I can get a Kevin Durant, I am absolutely doing it. Um, Trey Young, again, I probably would... Uh, I pause and I hesitate on that one. That one's a, that one's a situational thing. I, I think that Trey Young's value 
is probably harder to find than a Fred Van Vliet. It's probably harder to find the bulk points, assists, and free throw percentage than the steals that uh, Fred Van Vliet does. So um, maybe it's not the biggest sell high, but I still think you're getting a little bit of value when you get a, a Trey Young. And I'm also less worried about his knees as well. So that's the other thing with Fred Van Vliet. When he's playing 39 minutes per game, we've had a last couple of seasons worth of data to suggest that he is going to break down at some point this season and miss some games. Now, it might not be for your fantasy playoffs and he might be healthy you run that risk but I think that there's enough evidence and there's enough um, logic for me to suggest that those things are linked Um, and for me I would want to be trying to sell high while I could and if I can get a good handsome return then I, I would definitely pull the trigger so for me Fred Van Vliet is a sell high. This next guy here is the long, low-hanging fruit, uh, and it is Andrew Wiggins. So Andrew Wiggins is the 13th ranked player in fantasy basketball right now. Now I know you're not probably going to get a top 25 guy for Andrew Wiggins. It's just not going to happen. People drafted him around pick 100 in the 90s. So you're not going to get that high of a return. However, I would still be happy to get a top 50 player for Andrew Wiggins. Um, you, you might be able to point to the fact that apparently he's trying on rebounds now. It's it's the def- Defensive stats, that's really boosting his value. It's the low turnovers. He's only averaging 0.3 turnovers per game, which is, um, especially early on in the season right now, a huge boost to his value. So if I went here and I actually just went and punted turnovers, if I just do that on the Basketball Monster website rankings page, um, where does Andrew Wiggins pop out? So he goes down to the 23rd ranked player spot. So he goes from 13 down to 23rd. So pretty decent change there. And then for me, two steals, 1.3 blocks. Um, it's just unsustainable. He is actually not a bad shot blocker for a wing slash guard player. He's never been this good at steals. Um, you know, last year he was 1.1. The year before that he was 0.9. The year before that it was 0.8. So again, I'd probably peg him more at like a one and one, not a two and a 1.3 kind of a defensive stat guy. And um, and I think the field goal percentage comes back a little bit. Although that's 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 something that could stick. So I think that he does have a decent chance to outrank what we were drafting him as. So don't sell him for someone near where you drafted him. I think it was a good selection, and he looks a lot better than uh, what I expected him to look so far this season. And um, some of that is carrying over from the playoffs. And again, that's another narrative you can use. But I think if you can get, to me, top 50 guy that really suits your build, a top 40 anyone anyone in the top 40, I would absolutely go ahead and do that. And um, it, it might not be one that's the easiest to execute because we might not, people might not be trusting it at the moment, but, you know, refer to the, the, the playoffs and the finals, especially, and how he looked there and, and talk about all the other Golden State Warriors guys resting and Clay getting ejected and all these guys, and he's going to have to take a bigger role and uh, he's figured out rebounding now and do all those kind of negotiation tactics and you might be able to get yourself a good return turn for Andrew Wiggins. Um, the next guy here, again, another one, low-hanging fruit. Uh, Brooke Lopez is 100% a sell-high candidate. Now, I uh, actually drafted Brooke Lopez in one of my drafts. Didn't think I would say that to begin the season, but he's on my Locked On Fantasy Basketball team. Um, I got him at like 120 or 126 uh, or something around that mark, just to get a center on my team. Right now, he is the 24th ranked player, and it is pretty much on the back of 4.3 blocks per game. The rest of it is 100% what we expect. In fact, there's probably room for it to improve. He's actually only shooting 36.4% from the field. That could definitely get better. Um, he's shooting more than I thought he would. You know, 11 field goals attempts is more than I expected. But 4.3 blocks is really the only reason he is sitting at this point in the season at that high of a ranking. Um, that's definitely going to come down. It's going to half. It's probably going to be closer to 1.5, 1.6 blocks per game. Um I think when you see Chris Middleton come back, you're going to see a bit of a mix-up to the lineup uh, and, and a shuffle around where Bobby Portis plays a bit more at the center and they don't play as much together anymore. Giannis plays a bit more at the the four and maybe small ball center a bit more. So the minutes might come down. He's playing 29 minutes at the moment, which is up from his 23 minutes last year and 27 the year before that and 27 the year before that. So you could see him lose a couple of minutes. Um, so for me... If you can sell high on those blocks and um, 
and and get some good value. I would take anyone sort of inside the top 50, um, probably inside the top 65, I would take for Brook Lopez. But other than that, I think if you can't get that, you just enjoy the ride while Chris Middleton is out and while he's while he's playing well. He looks good too, so he looks like he's doing well. And like I said, that field goal percentage definitely can come up to closer to 50, high 40s, and you could see him averaging closer to 15 points per game whilst Middleton is out, uh, which would be a nice little bit of a surprise for, for, for Brook Lopez. But at the moment, the blocks are just hugely overinflating his value, so I would be definitely looking to capitalize on that for Brook Lopez. Uh, three more here, guys. couple of more controversial ones. Um, maybe not this first one here, but the next one uh, after this guy in, in two picks time will be a controversial one. I want to hear your thoughts. But first, before we get to that one, uh, Jonas Valanciunas is my next one. Now, Jonas, is uh, he's looking like a bit of an animal on some of these games. I am still a little bit worried, though especially because of what we saw the last couple of games with them relying a bit more on a defensive um, a defensive minded lineup to close games players like Larry Nance Jr Trey Murphy getting in to finish games over a Jonas Valanciunas is the trend that we were worried that we were going to see in this season with Zion coming back and this Pelicans roster is just it's bloody deep. It's it's a good, good team. They've got a lot of different avenues, some different lineups and, and styles of play that they can throw out there. So depending on their matchup, depending on how the game is going, they can elect to play Jonas Valanciunas out there as a dominant rebounding bully ball type center, or they can... Um, they can get someone out there who, like a Larry Nance Jr., or even go with Zion at the center and play your Trey Murphys, play uh, Herb Jones at like the threes and fours, um, and, and be a bit more versatile switching defensive team um, and, and elect to do that. He's he's put up some really big lines so far. He's had a game, 30 points, 17 rebounds. He His first game of the season, he had a double-double. Um, the re- game that I'm referencing against Utah, where they did go small, he only played 24 and a half minutes, put up six points and nine rebounds. The, the last game, he only played 22 minutes, still put up 13 and seven on good efficiency. But it's those games there that if other people are not paying as much attention to, those are the ones that, that highlight why I was scared of, of Jonas Valanciunas um, to, to be drafting him. And I think that you can still use the 30 and 17 and the 15 and 13 games at the moment to get good value. He is the 25th ranked player on the season at the moment. If you can get someone in the top 40, I'd probably be pulling the trigger um, just because I am a little bit worried about the uh, fluctuation and the fact that you probably can't rely on his minutes on a week-to-week basis, on a game-to-game basis, and in a head-to-head league especially, that is going to be tough and frustrating at times. Imagine, you know, in your fantasy playoffs and... You're coming up, you really need some rebounds, you really need some good field goal percentage, you're relying on JV to do it for you, and he goes out and plays 22 minutes and he puts up six points. Um, it's it's tough. It's it's a tough one for me to really rely on. I think he'll still be good, he'll still be well decent, and, and he will have big games. Um, he is a good per-minute producer, he's efficient, so... By no means is it a lost cause or anything like that that I'm super concerned that he's going to um, completely fall away. However, I just don't think that the consistency is going to be there. And again, whilst his ranking is high, whilst the memory of that 30-17 and 17 game is fresh in our heads, um, I still think there's an opportunity to sell high on Jonas Valanciunas. Um, here is a controversial one, and I, I guarantee you that people in the comments are going to be disagreeing with me, and you might, and, and I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but I think that Paolo Boncaro is a sell high. Um, he was in the top 10 bus show. He was at number 10, so whilst I know I've already received a few comments from you guys saying that, oh, I'm going to be sorry, I'm going to have to apologize to Paolo in the in the fantasy playoffs, and I very well might, and I prefaced that at the time. When I put him at number 10, I said he could very easily beat that ranking, and he could do well, and so far, there has been nothing really to uh, make me doubt that, although um, just the attention... The excitement around Paolo is very, very high right now. He's he's breaking records. He's setting records that LeBron James previously held. You know, most 20-point games from a rookie to start their career. He's got five in a row now. There are still concerns that I have about um, his 
ability to be a good fantasy player. I think he's going to be a really decent and a really good real-life player, but I, I still have my concerns about his fantasy translation. You've seen glimpses of it, right? In a couple of games against Boston and Atlanta, he shot 31% from the field and 33% from the field. Now, he has had games where he shot 61 in his rookie, sorry, in his um, debut game. Last game, he shot 52%, 52.6%. The free throws as well, I think, is something that we could easily see that swing the other way. He He's at the moment averaging uh, 80% from the free throw line, which is actually, so far, a slight negative. Um, and because he's taking nine free throw attempts per game, if that ticks down to like a 75 or a 73%, you're looking at, you're looking at Giannis level punt free throw percentage territory. And it's not necessarily something that I think a lot of people drafting Paolo Boncaro expected or um, or even think that is possible at the moment because he's playing so well and he has had games where he hits 80%. But if that changes just a little bit, and there is definitely reason to suspect that it might, Paolo Boncaro could be someone that really hurts your team in areas that you might not be ready for and you might not be able to recover from. Now, I think he is going to be good in points. He's going to be a good rebounder. He looks like he's someone that can get you some decent assists. But it's the other things, the steals. I don't, I don't think the blocks are real either. 1.6 blocks per game. Um, I mean, mate, it's probably better than I feared. I don't think he's necessarily going to be a bad box blocks player. But I don't think he's getting it gets you 1.6. I think he's probably closer to one block per game as a best case scenario. Um, the, the steals probably under one per game. It's really those percentages that really I think are a bit of an illusion at the moment. I think the threes could come down, and I don't think he's going to be scoring this well. I mean, look, he might he might be okay. He, he probably will be a 20 plus per game scorer. But when you, those other stats there are just all below average, you've got the makings of someone that can hurt you more than he helps you. And combined with the fact that he's a new shiny toy, he's the number one pick, he's breaking records, he's very exciting, he's fun to watch, um, he's built like a tank and people love him. He, uh, I think that you can get a really good return for Paolo Boncaro. If I can get someone who's a top 50 player, I'm doing it for Paolo. If I can get someone, if I can get the other rookie, Jabari Smith Jr., and I know you, you probably expected me to say this, I would 100% do it. If I could get someone, let's talk about some of the buy low candidates that we had yesterday. If I could get a Bam at a bio, I would do it. If I could get a Cade Cunningham, I would do it. If I could get a Drew Holland, Today, I would 100% do it. Probably wouldn't do or pull the trigger on Alperen Shangun. He's got his own issues, so he was a buy low yesterday that I wouldn't be trading Paolo Boncaro for. But I think that there is, again, probably controversial. If you disagree, let me know down in the comments and state your reasonings as to why, if you think that his free throw percentage is going to be fine, um, if he's actually just gotten better, that, that's a legitimate possibility. But I have skepticism to think that it will. I just will leave you with the fact that he did shoot in his... Um, in his college season, I will just pull that up because um, I'm pretty sure he was a poor college free throw shooter. And usually that is one of the safest ones to translate because the free throw line is the free throw line. Yeah, so he shot 73% from the free throw line in his college season. So if he does that, if he shoots 73% from the free throw line on nine attempts per game, um, we are legitimately legitimately looking at a Giannis level kind of negative. So Giannis at the moment is shooting 10 free throw attempts per game. He is he is shooting 62.5%, so a little bit worse, but he was about that kind of 72% from the free throw line last year, and he was one of the biggest negatives in the league in free throw percentage last year. So Paolo has the potential on being that kind of a drag to your free throw percentage. And if you're not expecting that and you haven't drafted accordingly, that is something that is really hard to come back from. So for me... Maybe controversially, Paolo Boncaro is a sell high. And the last guy, the last sell high, uh, I can't believe I haven't mentioned him yet, but Tobias Harris. Yes, Tobias Harris, my number one bus candidate, is a sell high. Now, I'm not falling for Tobias Harris. You're not tricking me, Toby. Uh, he is someone who is being okay to start the season. He's done some all right things. Uh, what's he averaging at the moment? Actually, this might be a tough one because of his last game. I've just looked at his most recent game, three points, 
Eight rebounds, six assists, a steal, and a three. But yeah, zero of five. Oh, sorry, one from five from the field. Um, you know, you had one turnover, didn't get to the line at all. So yeah, pretty bad performance. Um, and something that I'm expecting a little bit more of from Tobias Harris, to be honest. But so far, he is still the 51st ranked player, higher than when a lot of places were ranking him. So maybe people feel justified by taking him where they did. Maybe you feel justified taking him where you did. I'm just going to remind you that he was my number one boss candidate. I still think he's going to be someone who's going to be around that 100th ranked player. By no means is he a player that you drop. I've never said that. I never said that he's going to be someone who you drop onto the waiver wires. But the fact that he was ranked inside the top 60 in the preseason, um, people were happy to draft him around that sort of spot. And he, we've already had evidence of him being outside the 100 last year when James Harden came across. There's zero upside of him getting any better than that um, this season. You've added PJ Tucker to the mix. He just doesn't do anything particularly well. He's sort of just average or below average in every area. I think that if you can get any sort of top 75, top 80 player for Tobias Harris, I'll do it. I'll, um, I'll pull the trigger and uh, I'll go for something that can be a bit more exciting, a bit more upside-y for me. Like I said in the previous show with the Kawhi Leonard, I had some people asking me legitimately, should I trade Kawhi Leonard for Tobias Harris? They wanted something safe and boring because Kawhi Leonard was um, stressing them out too much. Sign me up. Give me Kawhi Leonard 100 days out of 100 Any time of day, any day of the week, give me Kawhi Leonard over Tobias Harris. I'm going to take that risk all day long. And um, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I don't feel like I've actually lost that much. I feel like I can replace what Tobias Harris gives me. And I want to take that swing on potentially a league-winning trade um, that could push me above everyone else. So for me, Tobias Harris is the final sell-high guy on this list. Let me know what you guys are doing and who you are looking to trade. If you've got trade questions, drop them in the comments below. Again, make sure you guys are subscribed. Make sure that notification bell is on so you get those videos coming out and you get notified straight away so you can get onto it for any of your league mates who might be watching this content as well. Um, Follow me on Twitter, at BallBoysNBA. And uh, make sure you guys, if you haven't already, hop over to Apple Podcasts. Give the podcast a rating, a five-star rating. That would be very much appreciated. Catch you guys next time. Bye.